that dynamic changes with taxes when you go to retire. And, and to your point, people just aren't aware of how that dynamic works after they retire. Uh, it comes as a surprise to a lot of people that Social Security is even taxable to begin with. And, but we go from this environment where we get a paycheck, we get a distribution from our business, we pay taxes on it, and we move on. That That's all connected to us. But then suddenly we, we start realizing, to your point, that some of these other things that we've always thought of as this powerful tool for retirement, and they are, like your 401k, your IRA, things like that, we still have to understand that the IRS is only so patient, and when you retire, their patience suddenly runs out, and they say, wait, I want my piece of that, and it catches a lot of people off guard. Starting your route to retirement. Hello, everybody. I'm Dean Barber, founder and CEO of Barber Financial Group and your host of The Guided Retirement Show. I've got a very special guest with me today, Stephen Jarvis. He's a CPA and he is the founder and the owner of Retirement Tax Services. We've recently formed a strategic partnership with Stephen and his team at Retirement Tax Services. And we're going to talk about things today that really are going to outline the importance of why your financial advisor should be collaborating with you and the CPA all at the same time. Before we hop into today's episode, I want to remind our listeners and viewers that you can access the same financial planning tools we use for our own clients on your own time and all from the comfort of your own home. All you need to do is visit the link in the show notes and click the Start Planning button from there, you can start building your retirement plan, no cost, no obligation. Please enjoy my conversation with Stephen Jarvis, CPA, founder and owner of Retirement Tax Service. Stephen Jarvis, CPA and uh, owner of Retirement Tax Service, welcome to the Guided Retirement Show. Thanks for having me, Dean. I'm excited to be here. It's interesting because RTS, Retirement Tax Services, has something in common with the Guided Retirement Show. They both have the word retirement in it. Why do you call it the retirement tax services. Why is that the name of your company? Yeah, there's a few things that go into that. That really one of the big things is that we we kind of made up this term of retirement tax. Uh, and when I say we made that up, uh, w what we did is we said, okay, most people don't really recognize that during their retirement, after they're done working, after their their earning years, the IRS still wants a piece of what they have. And so we we put it around this term of retirement tax. And the way I define that is it's it's the six or seven figure bill that you're gonna pay the IRS over your retirement. And so we, we look at it that way because we wanna have long-term conversations. We wanna help people plan ahead and reduce the amount of tax they pay over their lifetime. All right, now we have formed a strategic relationship together where I, I'm gonna call it, I'll call it business partners because yeah. we do things in common for our clients. You have a very strict rule. You won't do a tax return for anybody <laughs> that is not currently working with a financial advisor. Talk more about that and why you think that's critical. Yeah, so so I'm a tax professional. You said it. I'm a CPA. I definitely care very much about the tax. That's my area of expertise. But what I realized early on is that taxes should be a passenger on the bus, not the driver. It's just one piece of the puzzle, whatever analogy we want to use here. And we've got to include it in, in a, a proactive and an intentional way in the rest of the plan. And so what I found to be the most benefit to the taxpayer, to the client, is to have somebody in their life who's both looking through the rearview mirror, looking at what happened, looking at what's on the tax return, but also looking through the windshield to say what's coming next, whether it's tax related or investment related or risk management or whatever it might be. Somebody's gotta be looking out for both of those things. And sometimes that requires multiple professionals. That, that, that often includes both a financial planner and a tax professional. So why not have them collaborate together? They, they definitely should. And I know this after being a financial advisor for 35 years. And I don't know how long you've been a CPA, but it's, it's more than 10. And, and, and so I know that there are pretty much no decisions from a financial perspective that somebody makes that don't at some point wind up on the tax return. And you use this term retirement tax. I, I kind of like that. I hope people don't think that it's a separate tax, that it's just the, you know, the tax you have to pay in retirement. But you're right. The, and, and I think if people can actually start to understand that taxes will be a fact of your life in retirement, but the fact of the matter really is, in retirement, you have more control over your taxes than any other time in your life if you've done a good job creating tax diversification. Yeah, that, that if you've done a good job creating tax diversification is really important. Because if we're not planning ahead, if we just 
kind of let things happen by default and we get to retirement, we actually kind of run out of the ability to make choices at that point. It's how have we set ourselves up to get there. And so when we named our firm Retirement Tax Services, it wasn't because we only work with people who are in retirement. It's because we want that long-term mindset because there's so many proactive choices that we can make that that set us up for that flexibility in retirement. Because for most people, taxes will end up being the single largest expense they have during retirement. Uh, it's either taxes or medical expenses. That's right. Um, and so it, it it's a big one, and people don't realize it a lot of times. Yeah, no, taxes are, are the number one wealth eroding factor facing Americans, right? And our tax code is so complicated. <laughs> 70, well, it was 76,000 pages before you know, some of the new things that have been tacked on. So I don't know, it's probably over 80,000 pages now. And I always tell people that if you ever want to win a game, you've got to know the rules to the game, but how can the individual be expected to understand the rules that Congress has given to the IRS to enforce? When a lot of times the IRS doesn't even know how to interpret what Congress wrote. Uh, You know, you've got me, Dean. Uh, You know, Congress doesn't ask for my input on what the tax rules should be. Uh, I gave up a long time ago trying to find the logic in tax rules. That th- There isn't any, right? Most tax rules are about behavior and votes. They're, it's not even about revenue. Right. And so stop trying to find the logic in it. To your point, y- you need to understand the rules of the game. And there's some people out there who do just a fine job preparing their own taxes. I always just get a little bit nervous that what's what's going to happen is that something's going to change and you're not going to realize it. Uh not that there's anything inherently wrong with doing your own taxes, but make sure there's somebody in your life who can watch out for those kind of those road markers of, wait, we need to think about something else here. Right. But even more important than that, I, I think, Stephen, is people don't understand that the decisions that they make throughout the year and, you know, oh, I'm going to go buy a new car. Uh, I'm just going to cash out that IRA that mm-hmm. I got over there at Vanguard and I'm going to use that money to go up buy a car. They didn't talk to a financial advisor because they don't have one. They didn't ask their CPA, where should they get the money from? Or they're doing their own taxes. And then they put that in, they're in retirement. Boom. Guess what you just did? You just made a lot more of your social security taxable. You made your uh, Medicare premiums go higher because you took the money from the wrong place. I mean, all kinds of things go bad. I love in retirement how, I don't necessarily say I love it. The rules of taxes change in retirement because You've got Social Security, which is taxed different than mm-hmm. any other asset. You've got dividends. You've got capital gains that are tax-free up to a certain level that can get messed up and start to become taxable by taking too much out of your IRA in a given year. And so you can see a scenario, and I know you've seen this as a CPA, where somebody thinks, okay, I'm in the 15% tax bracket or I'm in the 22% tax bracket. I'm going to take some money out of my IRA. They take twenty thousand dollars out, thinking I'm in the twenty percent bracket. I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay what four thousand dollars, right? What they didn't realize was that that twenty thousand dollars caused fifteen thousand dollars of Social Security to become taxable, and that fifteen thousand dollars of taxable Social Security started causing dividends and capital gains to become taxable. So now all of a sudden we're paying forty five percent tax, and people are like, "What just happened?" And you're only talking about the federal level. That's yeah. not even, we're not even getting started on the state level. Yeah, but isn't it? It's complicated. It's convoluted. And so the reason I was kind of going down that path is because I don't think people understand how critical it is that before they make a financial decision of taking money out of any type of an account, they should be collaborating with both their CPA and their certified financial planner to say, what's my best option here? Yeah, for a lot of people, you know, vast majority of Americans uh, have been W-2 employees for a lot of their career, and they've done a great job saving, accumulating for retirement, even, even as a business owner, uh, you know, the, the dynamic changes with taxes when you go to retire. And, and to your point, people just aren't aware of how that dynamic works after they retire. Uh, it comes as a surprise to a lot of people that Social Security is even taxable to begin with. And, but we go from this environment where we get a paycheck, we get a distribution from our business, we pay taxes on it, we move on. That, that's all connected to us. But then suddenly, we, we start realizing, to your point, that some of these other things that we've always thought of as this powerful tool for retirement, and they are, like your 401k, your IRA, things like that, we still have to understand that the IRS is only so patient. And when you retire, their patience suddenly runs out and they say, wait, I want my piece of that. And it catches a lot of people off guard. Yeah, it really does. And in a lot of cases, like let's say for an example that somebody took money out of an IRA 
in, in retirement. They didn't realize it was going to cause more of their Social Security to become taxable. Mm-hmm. They didn't realize it was going to cause some of those extra dividends to become taxable. You took it out, you can't get it back in, right? It's an irreversible financial mistake. So I see people virtually, I'll, I'm not say everybody, but the vast majority of the people that aren't coordinating with a CPA and a CFP collectively are most likely overpaying their taxes. And they're not overpaying their taxes because the tax return was done improperly. They're overpaying their taxes because they've missed opportunities that they didn't even know existed. Yeah, one of the biggest things I work both with taxpayers and financial advisors on is trying to break this idea that tax time is April, right? That might be when the tax filing deadline is, but we should be talking about taxes year round. And that that reinforces what you're talking about, about the power of collaborating between financial advisors and tax preparers is that as we have that conversation year round, now we can start making better decisions about where we take money from, about when we recognize income. And we can do that because if we wait until March or April to go talk to our tax preparer and say, hey, here's what I already did last year, our opportunity for decision making is over. Yeah. If instead in May or June or July, we proactively say, I'm thinking about doing whatever it is, now we can make decisions. Now we can stop overpaying the IRS. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What do you call that? Don't don't tip the IRS. Yeah, there's there's no patriotic awards for for paying the IRS. T- uh, tip your server, not yeah. the IRS. Yeah, <laughs> the ways we like to say say yeah. that. Yeah, and so let's talk about some of the ways that you can really help by being that that tax professional working alongside the financial advisor. We're we're painting some pretty broad brushstrokes about hey yeah. It can make a difference, but I think if I'm if I'm looking at a client situation, and that client is going to retire this year, they're 62 years old, and one of the decisions that they have to make is when should I claim my Social Security? A lot of people think that Social Security claiming is synonymous with the date that you mm-hmm. retire, especially if you're of that age where you can start claiming it. I think the social security claiming decision is twofold. Number one, it's a tax decision Mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a, it's a lot of a huge tax planning decision because it can mess up the ability to do some creative tax planning. And it's a decision that's going to impact not just the married couple, but the surviving spouse as well. So let's talk a little bit about how you would look at, at when somebody should claim their social security. Yeah, it's a great question. And again, highlights the power of collaborating between between the two professionals. Because as a tax professional, uh, I love being part of that conversation, but I'm not going to give the final recommendation to a client because there are those other things that get involved. But from a tax perspective, we we want to look for ways that we can create flexibility in our decision making as it comes to taxes. So what I mean by that is, okay, our biggest opportunity with the IRS is understanding, am I going to be in a lower tax bracket in the future or in a higher tax bracket? And then deciding, does that mean we move up some income or do we delay some income? Do we move up some expenses? Do we delay those expenses? And so by looking strategically at when to claim Social Security, we could potentially create a few years for ourselves between retirement and claiming Social Security, where now our income is suddenly lower than it's ever been when we were working and lower than it's going to be when we claim Social Security or when we start taking required minimum distributions. And now we've created this window where we can recognize capital gains at 0% tax. Now we've created an opportunity where we can get money out of an IRA in the 10 or 12% bracket instead of the 22 or 24 or higher percent brackets. Uh, And and, and you can do that and and do a Roth conversion. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're creating this flexibility where we have some years where, where yes, we're putting off when we might claim Social Security. Uh, which is going to impact how much we get. And if, if we can delay that, we're going to get more. But more importantly, we're creating some years of flexibility. And that might make sense for some people and it might not for others, but we should certainly go through the evaluation. Yeah. And just going back to the fact that pretty much any financial decision you make is going to have an impact on Absolutely. your tax return. It's going to show up there at some point in time, right? Yeah. Um, think about when people are in their peak earning years. They're generally in their mid to late 50s, early 60s. I'm making more money then than I've ever made in my life. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, the IRS comes out with this new rule they call SECURE, right? <laughs> the SECURE Act. And, and the acronym actually stands for setting every congressperson up for <laughs> retirement enhancement, right? Uh, because 
that that act was actually one of the biggest money grabs that I've ever seen Congress pull and say that it's something totally opposite of what it is. And, a, and the reason I bring it up with that person that's in their peak earning years is because that's the person who is the most likely to inherit an IRA from their parents because their parents are in their 80s. Yeah. Okay. Late 70s or ladies. That's when that's when people start passing away. People think, well, my kids are going to get my IRA. They're going to not be in as high a tax bracket as I am. Well, take a look at the people that are inheriting money. It's not the 15, the 20, and the 30 year olds. It's the 50 and 60 year olds that are in their peak earning years. And now all of a sudden with the Secure Act, all that money is going to be forced out of that IRA at probably the highest tax bracket that there's ever been. And they never would have paid that had they done some proactive tax planning. So I think a lot of people say, well, if I'm going to do tax planning, I got to do it before I retire. No, it's through your entire life you have to do tax planning. Oh, I completely agree with that. Whatever age you are at, if you are filing a tax return, there is tax planning we can do. Whether you are 18 or 80, now it's going to change over time. No, there's not going to be quite as much I can do with an 18-year-old. I can set them on the right path. But at any point, if you're filing a tax return, absolutely, we can do tax planning. Uh, and the Secure Act's a great example of of the the power of tax planning because what what you're alluding to one of the biggest things that it did it was was force people to have this much shorter time window when if they inherit an IRA they've got to they've got to distribute it which means the IRS gets a cut of that and what I see in practice quite often is that people will that the, they'll inherit that IRA and then they just assume because no one's told them any better that well I've got to I've got to transfer that to a different account so I've got to distribute the whole thing and now they've taken an entire lump sum in one year. And they pay taxes at the highest possible rates and they get killed in taxes, absolutely killed. And even though the Secure Act shortened the window where we have to do that, we, even within that window, though, we have opportunities to plan if we're being proactive, if we actually have an inherited IRA instead of just taking a huge distribution and paying all the taxes. Yeah, I, I, you're, you're making me chuckle because, um, you know, Ed Slot, mm -hmm, a good yeah. friend of mine, and, and I've been studying with him for years, but uh during uh, our meeting back in the spring of 2022, uh, he went through a private letter ruling where a father died, and I think the wife had already passed, and the two boys inherited the money. Mm -hmm. And these two boys happened to be, I think, in their 40s. And there was a couple of million dollars in the IRA. And these two boys immediately wanted to start trading stocks in the IRA. Well, the custodian or the financial institution where the money was held didn't allow stock trading. Oh no! Okay, so these <laughs> so these boys, not knowing what they're doing, yeah. they took the entire two million dollars out mm -hmm. of the father's IRA, opened up another account, and started trading stocks. And we're really surprised that they had to pay taxes on that entire $2 million in that year. And so they filed for a private letter ruling claiming that they didn't know that that was going to happen. They <laughs> thought that they could inherit. There was an IRA. We inherited the IRA. Well, yeah. you didn't do it right. Yeah. 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 The, 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 the question um, that the, the you have to ask is, do you have an inherited IRA or did you inherit an IRA? And that might sound like a really small distinction, but this is exactly what we're talking about. Did you get a whole bunch of money? Did you just have an inheritance or did you actually keep it in an IRA? So you've got this 10 year window to do something about right. it. And, and those, those rules are super strict when yeah. it comes to inheriting an IRA. And if you mess one of them up, very chances are very rare that you're going to get anything, any kind of sympathy from the IRS because they say our rules are clear. Yeah, which, well, that's, <laughs> that's debatable, but that is their opinion yeah. that, that their rules are clear and pleading ignorance does not help anyone, which is, it, it's a fascinating sort of industry in that the tax code, you mentioned, you know, 80 plus thousand pages, uh, and yet your everyday consumer is expected to be able to file their own taxes and understand all that. That's, it's, it's nonsense. Right. Well, there's a program. There's a program. Yeah. Exactly. If it goes through a software, it must be perfect. <laughs> yeah, there's a program. Yeah. But, well, you use a program, but you're a professional looking at all of the different nuances that understand the rules that if you change one thing over here, it could have a more favorable outcome over mm -hmm. there. And if you make this mistake, it could have a less favorable outcome. So you're able to play that scenario. And I think that there's a lot of people who have kind of, and some people can use this, right? The free, 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 free tax returns, <laughs> right? Um, you and I were kind of joking about that at, at dinner last night. Uh, and, you know, yes, the tax preparation might be free. 
but what did it cost you? Yeah. And and unless you unless all you had was a thirty thousand dollar W two and you had no dividends, no interest, no IRA contributions, no, it's fine. Okay. But for somebody who is in their forties, fifties, sixties, that's accumulating some money, they got uh, you know more than just a, a couple of W twos. It's time to start getting some professional help. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I love software, but one of the one of the common myths about taxes that I really try to break down is this idea that well, if it went through a software, it must be right, because uh, it's just not the case. Uh, and I, I like the software p- platform that I use; it's a great tool. But to your point, that that expertise still needs to be there. Uh, and those those free, 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 free platforms. What you'll notice, think think back to the last time you used it, or keep this in mind the next time you use it. Most of what they're doing is steering you towards trying to get the biggest refund right now as possible. Right. And while refunds might feel good when you get them, that is not how we win against the IRS because a refund is just the IRS giving you your money back. Right. uh, After they took an interest free loan from you. And, and, and it's created this mentality for a lot of taxpayers of as long as I get a refund, I must be winning. But I've, I've worked with taxpayers who, um, they, they only focus on, Hey, I got a $5,000 refund. I'm doing so great. And then when I say, actually the IRS kept $80,000 of your hard earned money last year. And they say, wait, what do you mean? I got a $5,000 refund. I said, <laughs> yeah, because you paid them $85,000 and you only owed them 80. And they, they just, a lot of people have no concept for how much of their money the IRS is actually keeping. You know, what would cure that? Is if you had to actually write the IRS a check every <laughs> month, just like you do with your mortgage or your health insurance or whatever. You got to write that check every month. That would change everybody's attitude when it comes to taxes. In retirement, guess what happens? You're writing that check every quarter. You're estimating what you're going to owe. You're seeing it. You're seeing, you're saying, ah, I got a million dollars in my IRA. No, you don't. You you don't have a million dollars. Well, no, look at my statement. But yet your statement says you have a million dollars, but you have a partner in that account. That partner's Uncle Sam. Go try to take that million and go spend it. You can't spend a million dollars because it's not all yours. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that's why a lot of times business owners are a little bit more, um, in my experience, are a little bit more likely to talk about tax planning earlier in their careers because they they have to write that check to the IRS. That's right. And a lot of W-2 employees just aren't as aware of it, but there's still tax planning opportunities for individuals. The, I, I hear a common refrain of, of, oh, well, business owners have more opportunities for tax planning. Maybe, but they really just have different opportunities. Like I said before, anyone who is filing a tax return has opportunities for tax planning, right? But we've got to have that context of understanding for, I mean, for the people listening to this podcast, think to yourself, do do you know how much you actually, how much of your money the IRS kept last year and then go double check yourself and and then decide if you think you need a tax professional in your life. We talked about a a lifetime of taxes and taxes will be a fact of life. And so a simple form of tax planning should even be should I be making contributions to the traditional part of my 401k or should I be making contributions to the Roth portion of my 401k? Should I contribute to a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA? Well, that's not a question that can be answered until you fast forward into the future and say, what do we project your net worth is going to be when you retire and start spending these funds? What do we think the tax rates are going to be at that point in time and then we can come back and do a calculation. Okay, if you did some in Roth, some in traditional, this is going to give you this. But I think one of the things I see people making mistakes on all the time, they, you know, it wasn't too long ago that the Roth 401k became available. Mm-hmm. I see people will come in, they'll sit down with one of our certified financial planners. They're, you know, in their mid 50s, they're in their peak earning years, and they are cramming all of their contributions into the Roth portion of their 401k. And you go and complete the financial plan and you realize that when they get into retirement, they only need $10,000 a month to live, but they're earning $300,000 a year today. So they're in a much higher bracket. I would say they're making a mistake. They shouldn't be making contributions to Roth. They should be making contributions to their traditional side, getting the tax deduction at that higher rate, then get into retirement and do what we talked about earlier start converting some of that money. Now you get the arbitrage there and you get to start winning a little bit of the game. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's it's only over time that we can come out ahead against the IRS of uh, understanding right now compared to where we're going to be in the future, do we think we're in a higher or lower tax bracket? Lower. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. I think lower. for most for most people right now, if we look to the future, pretty pretty confident that tax rates are going to go up. Whether it's the sunset of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or all of the nonsense that Congress constantly talks about, uh, I think there's a pretty good chance that we'll all be in higher tax brackets in the future. So you do a uh, a podcast on your own, mm-hmm. and you write an awful lot of content. Yeah. You have people from the general public reaching out to you saying, hey, Stephen, I, I like what you're saying. I like what you're doing. Can you help me with my taxes? And you, t- and you say what? They say, yeah, I'm more than happy to if you'd like to get partnered up with an advisor who also works with us because th- there's just so much power in that collaboration. And for me, uh, I don't want to just I don't want to compete with H&R Block with who can do the most 1040s in a year. Uh, I, I want to I want to have real impact on people. I want to add real value through tax planning along with the necessity of filing a tax return. So I'm only working with consumers, only working with taxpayers who have an advisor who's willing to collaborate with me. Yeah, and I think that's a beautiful thing. And as you know, before we formed our strategic relationship and we've had CPAs in-house here, but we want to do uh, expand what offerings we were able to help. You've got some bandwidth. So it's super exciting for us to be partnered together with you because there are not a lot of CPAs and I, and I know you're a CPA, so don't take any offense to this, but there are not a lot of CPAs who actually get the impact of the long-term uh, tax plan. And I heard, and this may be, you maybe heard the same thing, but Ed Slot said that back in the day when he was getting trained, you know, that the, the whole objective was to do the tax return and see how big of a refund you can get a person that year. You're not, they, they would never say, Hey, look into the future and see how we can impact it in the future. And that's the vast majority of CPAs out there. Yeah. CPAs, enrolled agents, whatever tax professionals you're working with, their focus is primarily that rear view mirror. And they are providing a necessary service. For sure. Um, we, we all, we, no, nobody wants to get those love letters from the IRS, right? I usually I refer to them as nasty grams. No, nobody wants those. Um, they're providing a necessary service, but where it becomes a really valuable service is where we combine looking at what happened last year with what can we do in the future. Right, right. And and it's hard to say what, what can we do in the future unless you're working with a financial planner that says, this is this person's objectives. These are all the places where they're saving money because where they're saving money doesn't necessarily show up on the tax return. Yeah, well, and, and I, I certainly share that excitement for our strategic partnership and for me, in part, it's because there there are many financial advisors out there who don't take the tax return seriously enough. Uh, it's actually a little bit surprising to me, maybe even concerning to me, how many advisors make recommendations to their clients that definitely have a tax impact because anything to do with money is going to have a tax impact. And they're making these recommendations without having ever looked at a tax return, without having looked, having talked to a tax professional. Yeah. And so that's where my excitement comes from and us partnering together is that you and your team were already really committed to the tax aspect. And so I know that it's going to be a collaboration because it has to go in both directions. There, there are plenty of things tax preparers need to do different. Uh, I, I'm also on a personal crusade to help as many advisors as possible realize that if they want to be responsible and provide value to their clients, they have to be getting tax returns. They have to be incorporating that. And that's something you and your team have been doing for years. But yeah, you can't, I, you can't even do a financial plan if you don't have a tax return. It's impossible. <laughs> Not, not a good one anyways. No, well, yeah, nothing of any quality. All right, so um, let's, give, let's give a couple of freebies here. Um, obviously, we can't give advice um, because, you know, in order to give advice, we have to know a person's overall situation. But we do know that there's a couple of things that are happening this year that people should be looking for and taking advantage of. So even if somebody decides that, I don't want to hire a financial advisor. I'm not going to hire a CPA. I want to give them a little bit of value on the podcast. And the two things I'd like to speak on briefly is the uh, high potential for phantom income coming out of mutual funds and a taxable account this year mm-hmm. and tax loss harvesting. So let's talk about the phantom income that could come out of mutual funds uh, in a taxable account. In a year like this, so I'll set it up a little better. We had a roaring stock market. And now the stock market's not doing so well. Mm -hmm. It's up and down. A lot of fund managers have turned over the positions with inside of their mutual fund, and that's going to create a problem. Yeah, it's definitely going to create a problem because for a lot of us, we look at our account statements as what has happened this year. Now, the way it actually works is we buy and sell stocks, which even if you own mutual funds, underneath those mutual funds are a bunch of 
stocks and other other uh, assets and positions um, that, that might have been accumulating value for years. And so some of those over their lifetime or the lifetime that you've owned them might actually be in a gain position, even though this year they're down. And so you're seeing on your statement, hey, I lost a bunch of money. And so you're thinking, well, I can't possibly have to pay taxes on that money I lost. That's not how that works. But in that activity, that, that turnover you're talking about, there could have been some gains that have been accumulating for years. And when those fund managers turn those over and create those gains, they have to distribute that those capital gains. So a lot of people could end up with taxable income for accounts that lost money this year. Yeah. And it seems totally counterintuitive. And it, you almost have to write it out and draw it out and put it on a piece of paper and, and, and for people to actually understand how it works. But I would say this, anybody that owns mutual funds in any kind of a taxable account, whether it's a joint account, a trust account, an individual account, any mutual funds that you own, you need to get a hold of the mutual fund company. If you're working with a good advisor, they should already be doing this. Find out what kind of embedded gains are in those funds. You need to find out what is the uh, potential capital gain exposure for this year. And you need to find out what is your cost basis for that fund right now, because it might be that you still have a little bit of gain in that position because you've held it for a year or several years, but the capital gain could be larger than what you're actually gaining the position is. So it might be smarter to sell that gain before the capital gain distribution takes place. Yeah. And Dean, as, as you go through all of that, it just, it, to me, it reinforces that most of us are going to get to a point in our life where it makes sense to work with a financial professional. Cause there's probably a lot of people listening to this podcast that say, well, Dean, you lost me halfway through that. And that's why there's such an advantage to working with a financial professional who can help you identify these things and a tax professional who can make sure it ends up on your tax return correctly. Yep. So in a year like this, when, um, the stock market's been all over the place. Uh, a lot of technology stocks down 40, 50, 60%. NASDAQ at one point was down over 30%. Who knows where it's going to wind up the year. Um, there is a tax strategy called tax loss harvesting. So talk about tax loss harvesting and why that makes sense. Yeah. So this comes back to making decisions when they're available to us under the tax code. So again, we, we talked about how... Um, the, you know, the, those, those investments we have become taxable when there's activity, when we, when we sell them. And so even though they might be in a loss position, we can go ahead and intentionally sell a position at a loss and actually go back and buy a similar position to go get back into. It can't be the exact same one. That's the wash sale rules. Uh, to go ahead and recognize a loss to either offset gains that we have, or we want to be strategic about this, of, of how it fits into our overall plan. This is not the kind of thing that everyone should just go out and do just because we talked about it on a podcast. But there's the potential advantage of offsetting other gains, of offsetting other income to lower our taxable income, create this tax benefit, even though we have other, other losses. This I always like to highlight that this also works in the other way as well, that we can harvest capital gains. And this goes back to understanding where we're at with our income now versus in the future. There, there is opportunity at times to recognize capital gains at a 0% tax rate. And so I, when I'm working with clients, I look at both, do we harvest capital losses, which is going to be a little more relevant in, this, in a year where everything's down, but also, hey, can we recognize, can we strategically recognize capital gains? Yeah, because if you can strategically recognize a capital gain and keep, and, and you're down, what is it, anything in the 15% bracket that's uh, at this point in time that is uh, zero tax on a capital gain? Yeah, if your ordinary income is in the 15% bracket, then your capital gains income is most likely going to be that 0%. Yeah, yeah. So- there's a lot of things that people need to be doing. I just thought we had to give a couple of freebies away, right? Yeah. Two other things I'd highlight really quick that might not be as, as applicable to all of your podcast listeners, but some of them is going to impact just differences 2021 to 2022. In 2021, a lot of people received COVID stimulus checks that those didn't happen again. And a lot, a lot of people didn't realize that that lowered their tax bill because that's how it was sent out was as a tax credit. So if you got a big refund last year and that was part of why you might be in for a surprise this year when your refunds lower. Same with the child tax credit. Child tax credits were a lot higher in 2021 temporarily. Those are going back down in 2022. So it's, it's a great reminder to make sure we're forward looking, we're, we're, we're planning ahead to say, let's, let's make sure we don't have any nasty surprises come April. Yeah. You know, as, as much as it might feel good for somebody to get a little bit of a refund, the last thing they want to do is have to write a big check. Yeah. Completely agreed. Yeah. Well, Stephen, thanks so much for taking the time to be here on the Guided Retirement Show. Uh, looking forward to the partnership and the collaboration and the ability for us to truly change the way that people look at their overall financial plan and tax situation and save them a ton of money over time. Absolutely. I'm here to help as many people as possible stop overpaying the IRS. Super. 
I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Stephen Jarvis, CPA, and I hope you can see at this point in time why it's so critical that you work with a CPA and a financial advisor that can collaborate together on your behalf. Don't forget, we're offering you access to the same financial planning tools we use for our own clients. Just get out to the link in the show notes and click the Start Planning button and begin your retirement plan from the comfort of your own home. Starting your route to retirement. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to leave a comment and share this episode with your friends. Investment advisory services offered through Barber Financial Group and SEC Registered Investment Advisor. 